Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Mandy. And thank you for singing. Even if it's a song you're not familiar with. Oh, praise the Lord. Uh, man, can you imagine that? And if, if y'all not familiar with that story, you need to go back and read it about uh, anointing Jesus and, and taking that expensive oil and uh, perfume, so to speak. And she gave everything. But she didn't give more than he gave. Amen. Jesus gave it all for us. And we give back our all. If we, if we give back, we lavish ourselves back on him. And we can never give enough. Amen. We can never give enough. Uh, but we can praise him. We can, we can praise him and worship him uh, for what he's done. And, and just give back. A big portion of what he's blessed us with and that includes hey listen that this message this morning's not on giving but it, I, there's something I've noticed everybody that falls in love with Jesus and experiences his grace they're givers uh, they are and uh, and you're not gonna keep them from giving they look for opportunities to give and I didn't plan on saying that, but I'm telling you, uh, we just give back a portion of what he's done, and I don't know, I get excited about that. Uh, if you got your Bibles this morning, turn to First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. We're about to conclude the First uh, Peter. Uh, we're going to get part of that chapter this morning. Uh, Peter, as I've said before, he knew something about grace. He knew something about God's grace. He knew something about mercy. He knew, he knew a whole lot about failure. And I'm not going to ask, you, ask anybody to raise their hands because if we're all honest, every hand would raise on this. How many times do you feel like a failure? How many times do you fail? Every time I attempt something, seems like it, we all we all are failures in many different ways. But we can't get stuck there because we're more than conquerors through Him and what He's provided for us. Peter knew that well. Again, that's not the main part of the message this morning, but I just wanted to say that uh, today's passage uh, is interesting in that the the writer here. Uh, the Apostle Peter, he's given instructions to fellow elders. Now, we don't use that term a lot in a Southern Baptist church, but uh, I just want you to know today it's not wrong to use that term elder. It's not wrong to use the, the, the term pastor. It's not wrong to use the, the term shepherd. It's not u wrong to use the, the term bishop. And uh, that has nothing to do with my last name, by the way. Uh, when I was going through seminary, they picked at me a little bit and said, well, if you, was a, if you were a Catholic, you, they could call you Bishop Bishop. Uh, and we kind of a running joke. But um, by the way, my parents, I've joked about this a little bit, but my, my, I was telling Maddie this morning, my, my first name is Kirk, those of you that know me. And my parents didn't have a clue about this when they named me, but I looked that up a few years ago, and it was like a, a Dutch or I think it was Dutch, uh, the, the meaning is church. So the Dutch word church, church, <laughs> Dutch word kirk, uh, the, that meaning is church, and then bishop means overseer. So my parents had no clue. They were naming church overseer, uh, which, which literally means pastor, yeah, or it can mean uh, elder, or it can mean uh, bishop, okay? So I'll, I'll talk about those terms a little more in, in just a moment. But and a lot of this is just knowing the context, keeping everything in the proper context. So, uh, but it's interesting that Peter is writing specifically to fellow 
elders or pastors or bishops, okay? Again, those terms all mean the same thing concerning the church. And when Peter gave this insight into shepherding, uh, well, we say he spent a lot of time, uh, he had spent a lot of time with the chief shepherd. Just remember that pastors are called to shepherd the flock. We're supposed to be lead, your leader. And, and some of you can question that some. So, nah, you know, you can point out some things that I'm probably failing at. And, and you may be right in a lot of areas. But I am called here at this specific time to this church to be a shepherd to you. That does not mean that I'm the ultimate shepherd. Because the ultimate shepherd, the chief shepherd, is the Lord Jesus. And, and nobody can take his... And the only way I can be an effective under-shepherd to him is to listen to him. Because the church, which is all of us... By the way, just because I have a, a, a title as, a, as a, a bishop, shepherd, teacher, you know, anything you want to uh, call me, like, like old guy said, call me anything, just call me for supper. But the uh, bishop, elder, uh, what what was the other one? Bishop, elder, and I left, I lost one. What was it? Pastor. I don't know why I forgot that one. Anyway, uh, he's he's writing specifically to fellow pastors, and he's explaining something from this this intimate relationship he's had with the chief shepherd which is Lord Jesus Jesus poured into a lot of people when he was walking here on earth he poured into more of an intimate way into those 12 as you all know the known as the main disciples but then he poured into a few of them even more than that Peter James and John but then he poured into one even more than those, and that was Peter. He did spend a lot of time with Peter. Peter was uh, obviously the leader of the disciples. He spoke up many times, and there were many times he spoke up when he should have had his mouth shut. And how, anybody identify? I can. Uh, Peter was the leader of the disciples in many ways, even through his failures. So it's within that, just know, all of these writings, it was all intricate pieces of the puzzle that God used to make Peter what he became, which was a very faithful preacher of the gospel. And he used them in so many ways. But uh, this today's passage, uh, of course, was written by this former fisherman, and Peter turned spiritual shepherd, and he was a natural, he was the natural fisherman, did that by trade, but he was a learned shepherd. So he probably grew up, obviously, as a young man, learning the trade of, of fishing and uh, commercial type things, and learning all this stuff, how to, how to be a, a good fisherman. In many, in many ways, that probably come natural to him a whole lot more so than, than becoming a shepherd. But here, this former uh, fisherman turned shepherd, and he's given instructions to the other shepherds of that time, the spiritual shepherds, and he's given instructions to us as well today. So that's why we have this passage, this scripture to help us with this. He, uh, he, he, catching fish wasn't the center of his life anymore, but catching men was. Catching men, women, boys, and girls with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's, that became his centerpiece uh, of his life. Peter transitioned from this casting. Y'all, y'all know what the casting of the net is, right? They take that net and, and boy, when we were on the Sea of Galilee, they, uh, it was kind of, uh, I guess, a, a little bit of a weak example, but they did the best they could. This, this guy, and the guy, they told us anyway, one of the guys leading the boat that we were on on the Sea of Galilee, they were going to show us a little bit how casting a net 
which it was, it was pretty interesting, but he didn't catch anything. Uh, so he, I don't know how good he was at it, but uh, our, uh, the guy that was leading our, our group that he spoke here a lot of times, uh, Roger Martis, he said, uh, this guy's name is Peter. And he said, you'd think he could catch some fish, but every time I've had a group on this boat, I ain't seen him catch a single fish. So uh, he, he, he didn't know that uh, trade very well, but, uh, but they, man, it, it, that whole ride on the Sea of Galilee was awesome. Um, and I think about this net. So he said to cast it means they showed how they gathered up to where when they would throw it across the water that it would spread easy and it would start to sink and then they would pull in the ropes to hopefully gather in the fish. That's a, a, a proper uh, process to do that. And as Peter's talking about this, he's, he's, he's talking about casting the net. He is... He has mended the nets. He, as a shepherd, you need to uh, even know how to mend some nets. Y'all ever thought about this when we have conflict with people and how we we need to mend relationships and we need to mend this or that? Uh, he's teaching me a lot about that. And uh, I've unfortunately done very poorly with that in times past. But Peter transitioned from casting and mending nets and rowing boats to listen to this, to feeding and tending and protecting and loving God's sheep. So he was having to learn a lot. He, learned, he did learn a lot from the Lord Jesus. Uh, here, here's some, I, I'm going to throw these, I don't do this a lot, but this is just to help us with the context of our time today, okay? And these numbers are old, by the way. This is probably two or three years uh, old. It may be a lot worse than this now. And this may surprise some of you, some of you it won't. 4,000 new churches begin each year. That sounds like a lot, don't it? We think, wow, that's good, right? Well, each year 7,000 churches close. We're losing ground. Over 1,500 pastors left the ministry every month. That was probably four or five years ago. Maybe more than that now. Over 1,300 pastors were terminated by the local church each month without any significant cause. In other words, it wasn't because of moral, moral failure. Uh, over 3,500 people a day left the church last year. And, and this, again, four or five years old. Many denominations are reporting an empty pulpit crisis. They do not have a shortage of ministers, but have a shortage of ministers desiring to fill the role of a pastor. And I believe this passage in or, or will answer for us a lot uh, of, of this question. Why do so many pastors leave the ministry? You know, it could be discouragement. It could be financial. It could be... Uh, not being able to work with people as well. It might be that the uh, church has a different direction than what the pastor wants to go. It may be any number of things. You could probably list a thousand of them. But the ones that are most important, I think, we're going we're gonna to see some foundational things here this morning. And remember, this is, while on the surface it looks like we're, this message is designed, and, and this passage is designed for pastors. So in a lot of ways, I'm preaching to myself this morning. However, you need to listen closely because you need to know what to look for in a pastor. You need to know what to expect in a pastor. You need to know from Scripture, what, is it, what does the Word of God say about shepherding the flock? And I don't cover the whole gamut today, but... But this is some really good, I think, foundational things. So let's look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Read it with me. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you. This is pretty well, he, Peter's saying, shepherd the flock. Uh, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily 
according to the will of God. There's a key to me that jumps off the page. According to the will, will of God. And not for sordid gain. In other words, pastors that are in this for the money, wrong, wrong business, wrong occupation, <laughs> wrong on many levels. So not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Verse 3, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, that's, who is that? Who have I already said that is? Jesus. Hey, I give you an opportunity to give the Sunday school answer. Y'all remember that? So if you don't know the answers in Sunday school, that's what one of the, uh, I didn't hear it here, but one of the kids uh, I've heard say before at a different church, they said, if you don't know the answers that the teacher asks, just say Jesus. It'll answer most of them. <laughs> so uh, that's a good cheat sheet there. Uh, and with the chief shepherd, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. What are we talking about? Elders in the church, not, not only they, this partially elder men in the church. You, you heard the phrase, uh, show respect to your elders, come right from the scripture. Right from the Word of God. But also, elders as uh, pastors show, be, be under their guidance. Uh, don't have so much pride that when, whether it's a pastor or Sunday school teacher, or whoever's teaching you the Word of God and says, the Word of God says this is sin. And we struggle with it because in today's world, we've got so much sin going on. We've gotten so used to it. We say, well, everybody does that. Why, why are you making a big deal of it? Because the Bible says it's a big deal. If the Bible calls sin, sin, guess what? It's still sin. It's still sin. And we, we look at it so many times like it's a smorgasbord or something, you know? Or we look at going to the restaurant and, and we, we say, uh, well, we'll have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and I don't like that, so I'm not going to deal with that. Uh, I'll, I'll take this because I like it, but I'm going to leave that. It's not a take what you want and leave what you don't. It's all or nothing. And while we may disagree on some of the individual things that, that could be debatable in Scripture, there's certain things that God, when he's dealing with sin, he just doesn't leave a whole lot of room, wiggle room on. And we have muddied the water so much, and unfortunately it's in the church many ways as, as well. So, uh, for God is, a, uh, oh, let, me, let me back up just a, minute, a verse there, to, to verse 5. Remember, you younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed, listen to this, and if you mark in your Bibles, I challenge you, this is a good place to mark, underline, put an asterisk beside it or something. This is very important. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, that's a verse we pull out a lot of times, and it is an encouraging verse. But we forget the verses that come before it. I love that verse, and I've quoted it before. That, you know, 1 Peter 4, uh, chapter 5, verse 7, casting all your cares or all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's encouraging, isn't it? We're not supposed to walk around with all the anxiety and the issues and stuff, uh, uh, we're supposed to cast our cares on him. Now, it may be a process in doing that. Most of the time it is, especially if we're a new believer, a young believer. We need to uh, make sure we're surrounding ourselves with other believers that can help us with things that we may not know how to handle. And that process of casting our cares, it is so... Uh, 
It's so applicable when we think about the church being the flock of God, his church. It's, it's funny, in, in some ways we're looking at scripture and, and the Bible gives descriptions of the church in different ways. He, he says it's the bride of Christ and one day he's coming back and there's going to be a great celebration because the bride of Christ, who is that? The church. What church? Well, it's not just a local church, it's a universal church. Everybody that's ever been saved has trusted him as their Lord and Savior through eternity past to the future. Whenever this celebration takes place, there's going to be a wedding ceremony. There's going to be a bride that has been, had all kinds of... By the way, that, that white dress, that means something. And, and uh, the, the white dress, while... While it may be stained and, and have all the scars and the, the, the dirtiness that, that we as believers take on many times because we fail so much and we sin against him even though we're believers, one day we're going to be presented to him pure, clean, and holy. Now that ought to get you excited because going back to what we said earlier, you may feel like the biggest failure in the world. But one day you're going to be presented to him as perfect and righteous. Before you get too excited, it's not because of you, though. It's because of who you placed your trust in. It's, on, it's all him. He is the, the source. So Peter, uh, he, as one of the elders, is encouraging the other elders to lead the people in the right way. And God has given us this example of shepherding the sheep to lead his church. Now, uh, I think I've got it on the screen for you, uh, what I was describing earlier, and then I leave one of them out when I'm trying to tell you. So if you could put that up on the screen, the titles of, of uh, bishop, elder, and pastor. There we go. If, if you're a note taker, you might want to jot that down. That way you, maybe you won't forget like I did a while ago. The, the word pastor, which I actually use more. Uh, and while you're jotting that down, I want to tell you this. Some churches are led by single or multiple elders. Some churches are led by single or multiple bishops. Some churches are led by single or multiple pastors. And most SBC churches, and if you're not familiar, Southern Baptist churches... Most of uh, our churches are led by uh, pastors. We call them pastors. And, and many times, if it's a larger church, uh, much larger than what our church is, you have multiple pastors. You might have the lead pastor, which is one that normally preaches and uh, leads in a lot of the study and teaching. But you have other teaching pastors. You may have special ministries. You may have a worship pastor. You may have a youth pastor. You may have multiple pastors and those are considered uh, what a lot of people call the elders in the church uh, with some of our C SBC churches they tend to be the leadership in the churches uh, G, uh, there is uh, the image of, of the shepherd tending the flock connected uh, it really connected with Peter's audience of that day. Mainly because there was so much ingrained in the Jewish uh, faith. We might say community or, or today they, they, the, that community word is thrown around a lot. But uh, the people of the Jews, that this Jewish family so to speak, they, that resonated with them. Talking about a shepherd, they, they connected with that. And uh, the shepherd tending the flock, they would immediately get a picture. And it may be somebody in their family. Or it may be someone they knew. Uh, they were all, not always looked highly upon. First of all, a shepherd stayed out in the, in the fields a lot. Now, somebody that stays in the fields a lot, especially with livestock, what do they tend to be? Physically dirty. <laughs> Uh, and they come in for a, and they had to go through a process of becoming clean too before they would come into the temple or they they'd come in to to worship. But 
Uh, here, here's the deal. A good shepherd, listen closely. A good shepherd's going to smell like the sheep. Why? Because he spent time with them. Looking after them. Helping them. Guiding them. Protecting them. Uh, for some reason, we have gotten uh, into a culture in the church today. There's so many pastors think they're not supposed to smell like the sheep. They're supposed to be at arm's distance. They're not supposed to have to identify with them. Not supposed to have to spend time with them. Oh, somebody else can do that. And that is so unscriptural. It, God never intended on that. It, apparently, they don't read First Peter five. Peter is telling the shepherds, you not only spend time with the sheep, if you're going to lead them, if you're going to be, you're going to have to be with them. You're going to hurt when they hurt. You're going to have to smell like they smell. You're going to have to identify with their issues, their problems. So it's a ch I'm telling you, that's a, tall ch that's a big challenge for, for all of us that are called to be pastors. So when Peter spoke about shepherds and shepherding, the, most, the people most likely thought of all the way back to Abraham. Anybody remember what Abraham's occupation was? Shepherd. Y'all can call that out, by the way, if I say that. What was Abraham's? Thank you. All right. What about Isaac? Come on. Shepherd. I'm making it easy for y'all. I'm telling you an answer before we get there. What about Jacob? Moses. David. See, that was easy, wasn't it? Because they were all shepherds. They're patriarchs. The people that they would learn their stories and they'd learn so much things that had been handed down from them. And all these examples of God's greatly using them in all kinds of different ways. All of them, at least, they were shepherds. And many people that were listening to Peter that day probably were reminded of David's Psalms, a lot of David's Psalms he wrote being a shepherd, or his experiences from being a shepherd. And which one, is, somebody tell me which one is the most famous one? Psalm 23. If you hadn't read it lately, read it. It's all about the shepherd, but it's talking about the, the, the great shepherd, the, the ultimate shepherd, right? Uh, David, growing up under a father who had taught him how to be a shepherd, and he has, was faithful even in his earliest years being a shepherd to his father's sheep. What does that tell you? First of all, the sheep didn't belong to him. They belonged to his father. What does that tell us today? As a shepherd, as a pastor, you don't belong to me. You belong to him. But this seemed to me even more responsibility of how I relate to you, how I lead you. Uh, David starts Psalm 23. Is it, any, is it any surprise when we look at Psalm 23 and the very first words are this, the Lord is my shepherd. Now think about that. He has learned from the earliest days how to be a shepherd. He's growing up being a shepherd boy. Who would ever thought... Someone being a shepherd boy, tending sheep, some of the most aggravating animals on planet earth. And yes, I can say that because I'm one of the sheep too, right? So God compares us to sheep. You say, that's kind of degrading when you think about it. No, it just puts us in our place. We are so dependent on him. Think about sheep or Sheep have so many predators. Man, the Bible talks about what were some of the animals that, that, that David protected the sheep from? said he slew a bear, right? A lion. He, and then little did he know at that time God was just preparing him to take down a giant. 
Little did he know God was preparing him. He's, even as a young boy on a hillside, just doing everyday mundane things. Listen, teenagers, children, listen to this. It's important to listen to your parents or whoever's in authority over you. It's important to follow your instructions. It's important to gain the, all the wisdom you can now because it may be everyday mundane things, but one of the simplest, most effective things you can do and one of the things that will bless you the most is to do what your authorities have told you to do. Submit to the authority God has placed over you. David did that. And little did he know God was preparing him to be a king. To shepherd the whole nation of Israel. He was the shepherd king. So verse 2, let's look at that. Shepherd the flock, as Peter is saying. This is the same term Jesus used in John twenty-one sixteen. This was after the resurrection when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the shore and they had been fishing all night. This was also the first time Peter talked with Jesus after he had denied him. So, again, I go back to, have you ever felt like a failure? You think of your worst days, the times you felt like the worst failure in your life, and it will be not even, comp it will not even uh, compare to the failure that Peter felt when he denied Christ before the crucifixion, and they locked eyes. Scripture teaches us that. They locked eyes. They, they looked at each other. Can you imagine when the Lord Jesus looked at him? He didn't have to say anything, did he? Because he told him it was going to happen. But pride that was in Peter had to be dealt with. And I want to tell you today, if we're going to be effective for the gospel and effective in our lives, for, for uh, leading people to Jesus, pride's going to have to be dealt with. And it hurts. I'll tell you, it, it is a painful process. Jesus' conversation with Peter didn't include anything like, I told you so. It didn't have any reprimands. But when he met him on that day on the shore, when he ran through the water to get to him. And y'all remember the story. Jesus had prepared fish for them that morning. This was after Jesus had been crucified. He was in the resurrected body. And he's on the shore cooking, it always amazed me, cooking breakfast for, the, for those disciples that were out there that day. Fish for breakfast. I'm just curious. How many people have ever eaten fish for breakfast? I'm impressed. I guess I have maybe on a mission trip or something, but I don't remember ever doing that in normal everyday life. But I love fish. I, I would love to have uh, eat some fish that Jesus cooked. I got a feeling that was some good stuff, Kerry. They had been fishing all night, didn't catch anything. Of course, you know the story. They, he said, hey, Hey, guys, you, you caught anything? And they're like, who is this? He said, how about try and take your net up and put it over on the other side of the boat? Well, now, if pride set in at that point, pride would say, are you out of your mind? We are, we've been out here all night. We've experienced fishermen. We know what we're doing. That's what pride would say. And you think we need to pull this net up and put it on the other side of the boat? How much... That boat, probably not too wide. I mean, you're just talking a few feet. Why would that matter? Because the Lord Jesus said so. There's times he's going to tell you to do something in your life. It ain't going to make any sense whatsoever. But if you're going to be obedient, you better listen. He said, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And then they couldn't pull it in because it had so, much, so many fish in it. And then he's already got fish cooked at, uh, on the shore and tells them to bring some of their fish as well. So here, Jesus' conversation with Peter, you got a picture of the chief shepherd and the Lord Jesus 
But he's given instructions to Peter. And what are those instructions? Well, John 21, 16 says this. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. Shepherd my sheep. Why is that important? First of all, the chief shepherd gave everything for the sheep. Do you know, we underestimate the importance of the church. And all these stats I'm talking about, that's people that don't have a clue about the church. They don't, under, under, they don't understand the purpose of the church. And many of us, grown up in church, we, we don't even really get it, get it many times. Jesus died for the church. You men have been married for, for, well, you don't have to be married for a long time. If you're married, you, and you should feel this way about your wife. You, you'd be willing to die for her because you love her. Right? He loves his bride. He loves his bride. So he's saying, shepherd my sheep. He's saying, Peter, you got to get on with it. I'm restoring you. You're forgiven. You've experienced mercy and grace. I don't have to give you anything else. Shepherd my sheep. Lead. This is, this is where I see Peter's writing turn toward a focus on, on what matters the most. When, when the chief shepherd appears, everything changes. Right? Peter, Peter's talking about the Lord Jesus, uh, and, and he's already had this command earlier. But when Jesus appears, it does, it changes everything. Uh, when he appears, ultimately someday when he appears and calls us home uh, to heaven, he, everything's going to change then. Awards will be given, uh, but judgment for the bad shepherds will take place as well. We've got scripture not dealing with it today in this passage, but... There, there are special warnings for pastors who take advantage of the sheep. There, there are special warnings for pastors who take advantage of Christ's bride. And it's happening all over the world. Now, I'm going to go as far as saying this, and I hope none of you listen or watch these name it and claim it preachers. It's so painfully obvious to me. I don't have to listen to much, much of a message from these guys until I know it's name it and claim it. And it's, it's not about glorifying God. It's about you getting what you want to make you feel better about yourself so that you can have more pride and that you can have more wealth. You can just name it, claim it. Sometimes it's about health. In our situation with our brother and sister, we're, we're praying for them. It's got a terrible sickness. They will be so, some, uh, some, not all, but some would be so bold as to say, if, you know, uh, if you just had more faith, they'd be healed. And uh, I'm sorry, flesh kind of rises up in me, and I want to hit somebody between the eyes when I hear stuff like that because that's so unscriptural, and it's very hurtful and it's very harmful for people that are going through times that they need, they need compassion, they need love, and they need, they need support and help. They don't need somebody telling them if they just had a little more faith, they'd be healed. It, uh, it really grinds on my nerves. But uh, this, this picture here, it, it's, by the way, it, it, it's funny to see how people react when, when authority shows up. Uh, we're talking about the great shepherd, the shepherd king, uh, uh, the ultimate shepherd king, which is the Lord Jesus. Uh, the chief shepherd, as we maybe need to reference today. When he shows up, again, everything changes. I, I thought about uh, uh, whether it's on a, the school bus when you have a substitute driver or some of these classrooms, y'all know how it is when you go to a classroom in school and, and the teacher's out and the sub's in there, you know? Uh, you teenagers, y'all don't give them a hard time, do you? Uh, nobody gives the sub a hard time, do you? Uh, 
the, the, it's amazing that things like that and when the, when the teacher comes back in the room, how if, if that's a person that has control over their classroom, it changes quickly. What about when the principal walks in? Well, if it's a principal in a school that has a real authority, uh, things change. Well, you multiply that many, many times over. When the Lord Jesus appears, when he's involved, things change. Changes our attitude, changes our direction, changes our desires, everything. And I encourage you to do it today, uh, keep on serving. No matter what you're faced with, keep on serving. Keep loving people that are hard to love. Keep honoring Jesus with your life. Keep humbling yourself before the chief shepherd daily. And keep giving and trusting him. Keep trusting him. Verse 4, the last part of uh, verse 4 says, You will receive the unfading crown of glory. Uh, and I referenced James 1.12. I don't know if I've got it on the screen, but you can jot that down. James 1.12 says this, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. It is on screen. And 2 Timothy 4.8 says this, in, in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You think it's important to be watching for his return? Yeah, we don't do that in there enough, do we? I, I'm telling you some of the best days I've ever had uh, in my quiet times when I've been sitting on my back porch or, or somewhere just by myself uh, early morning, and for some reason that cup of coffee's got a part of that, but... Uh, I'm sure it's not that major, but I really like like that sitting there. And uh, having that cup of coffee and, and having the Word of God open, and to just think, especially like today, uh, Janice mentioned this earlier, that how what a beautiful day we have to come here, to be a part of, of worship together. But to sit and to look and you think, you know, today could be the day. There's nothing holding him back. Today could be the day. And, and if that doesn't excite you, then you might need to get saved. If that doesn't excite you, you may be saved and just need to get right with him. I don't know. Every, there's a lot of people with a lot of different situations. I'm just telling you, you should be, when you hear, boy, Jesus could come back today. If that strikes fear in you, something's wrong. You need to get that right, whatever it is. But if you're excited... So, wow, I'm not perfect, but I am forgiven. And to, that excites me to think, wow, it could be today. Verses 5 and 6, I want to focus on that just a moment. He says, he is against those who, who are proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Oh. Uh, we have so many warnings about pride. We have from Scripture where so many places, God is showing us over and over and over how he deals with pride. We see it in the life of Peter. I've already said that earlier. When before Jesus was crucified and, and for the Lord Jesus to have to tell Peter, Peter is standing up. I can just see his chest poked out. And... And uh, Jesus already talked about there's certain ones that are going to fall away from me. Certain ones are going to... Some of you, he's talking to the disciples. And Peter stands up, and you can just see it. He's saying, Lord, every one of them, every one of these. It's his brothers. He's saying it in front of them. Boy, that's prideful, isn't it? it make, I bet you some of the disciples are saying, why won't we slap him? He, but he's standing there, and he says, Lord, every one of them may fail you. They may betray you, not me. I'll be with you through everything. And he turns to him. Can you imagine the melting process? As Jesus turned to him and said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. 
What a slap in the face. You know, nobody can kill pride like Jesus. He dealt with it head on. He faced it in the Pharisees. And unfortunately, religious stuff, we can get caught up in all kinds of religious activity that are good and uh, really good in and of themselves, but we can become pride-filled and go into church. Well, they don't ever go to church. I'll go to church. And if y'all have never done that and you've been to church all your life, well, I need to talk to you. Because I have. We make it about a church attendance instead of about the heart. Now, we'll say this. When you fall in love with Jesus, you're going to be part of his church because he loves his church. I don't see how it can separate. But where we need to separate is how we view other people, whether they're doing what we're doing or not. That's not... Anyway, he deals with this. He's against those who are proud. And my whole point there is it doesn't have to be people on the outside looking in. It doesn't have to be necessarily just lost people. It can be saved people. It can be people in the church. It can be us. He resists the proud. What does that mean? That's something we don't want, folks. We don't want God resisting us. You ever went to pray? Ever somebody mentioned in Sunday school this morning about you ever struggled in prayer and just hit a wall? Oh, man. Anybody that's ever that's been a Christian very long? No. You know, don't you? You have times you pray. I've tried to pray. I just can't pray. I just, I'm hitting a wall. Well, that could be for a variety of reasons. It might be sin that's unconfessed. Maybe something that he is taking you through. He's just silent in because he wants you to seek him out with your whole heart. It may be a process that's very difficult. But for whatever it is, just know he, he, he has a purpose and a plan for all of that, but he resists the proud. And if we've got something in our lives that is rooted in pride, by the way, every sin, I believe, has some kind of connection with pride. And if it's unconfessed, if we refuse to pray or confess it to him or to get right with him then that's obvious pride isn't it or we have that embarrassment we don't want to you know we don't even want to talk to God about it so that's pride here as a believer we'll focus on that for just a moment because we're talking about the church talking about shepherding talking about uh, pastoral roles and things if if you have God resisting you this is going to be because of pride some form or fashion and that is that's not what we want we can not only is our prayer life hindered we're not an effective Christian we're living life in vanity you ever you ever wonder sometimes like what is the purpose of my life? I feel like I'm just spinning my wheels. You may be. We don't want, we never want to be in that category of him resisting us. So, what about the second part? He gives grace to the humble. So, here we go, the contrast. Pride and humility. So we've got to get rid of the pride and be humble before him. So here's how we wrap it up. For the pastor shepherd, he realizes that the sheep are not his. They're, they're God's. They belong to someone who has given everything for them, and his love for, the, for his sheep is what motivates the shepherd. Because here... For me or any other pastor, we, we have to answer to God of how we shepherd, how we lead. And I'm fully convinced that uh, many pastors don't get it. And I've missed a lot of it myself. The shepherd, as I said before, will smell like the sheep. You, 
here, here's the last two, last two questions I want to ask you, and we're going to close. Janice, if you would come on. Uh, do you know the shepherd? Do you know the shepherd? The chief shepherd? Do you really know him? Personally. And aren't you glad we don't have to depend on a priest to talk to him? Aren't you glad? I know that contradicts some religious beliefs, but he tore down a lot of walls for us. He gives us access straight to him. And that should be something we celebrate. Here, here's the next question. <clears throat> Are you one of the sheep? Are you one of the sheep? And is he the shepherd of your life? Do you know him? Do you really know him personally? Everybody stand.